Good morning. We're coming up along the Slate Creek Canyon here in the Mazatzal Mountains, and I'm going to break here to talk about a very nice TV series. Vision of Escalone. An ordinary high school girl with a family heirloom is magically transported to an exotic new world where she finds danger, adventure, and romance. You could probably tick off half a dozen anime titles that fit that description without even thinking too hard about it. Uh, Fushigi Yugi, Himiko, Twelve Kingdoms, that's enough thinking. It's rarely been done better than an Escaflone. I'll be looking at the 26 episode TV series today. Itomi is the winsome high school heroine, a sweet teen who runs for the school track team. She has a crush on that team's handsome captain. She likes to weave rub fortunes for her friends using tarot cards, and she's pretty good at predicting with Alice. She also wears a small pendant that was a precious gift from her grandmother. Hitomi is running an important time trial for that track team captain, when a pillar of light suddenly drops a visitor from another world directly into her path. That sword-wielding young man is Vaughn. He may be confused by the shift in scenery around him, but he's more focused on the fire-breathing dragon that came along with him. In the resulting violent chaos of the dragon fight, Hitomi has a vivid premonition of that young man's death, then rushes to warn him. When a second pillar of light appears, she's swept up with the visitor and carried off. We're not in Kansas anymore, or Tokyo either. Welcome to Gaia, a world where both the Earth and the Moon hang in the sky. It's a world of strange creatures, such as dragons, people with wings, and chimera people too, half man, half animal, such as tiger men, dog men, and what half-breed world would be complete without cat girls. Vaughn isn't just some random warrior either. Now that he's slain a dragon in a rite of passage, he's king of Farnalia. That cat girl is Marilou, Vaughn's friend since they were kids. She's very possessive of Vaughn, and she doesn't take well to the new girl that Vaughn brought back with him from his quest. King Vaughn also has a giant robot called a Melf, and it's not just any mecha, but the legendary Escafone. He's going to need it, too, because a war is brewing. The armies of Zybak are on the march, and they've got some neat Melfs, too. Their field commander is Delandu, a nut job with a past so weird even he doesn't know it. Advising him is Falcon, who was once one of Vaughn's countrymen in Fernelia, who switched allegiance to Zybak. Zybak's leader is an odd, mad scientist, Dornkirk, who believes that he's discovered how to plot destiny like a road map. He's trying to manipulate fate with a newfangled contraption he's invented, and I don't think he ever walks away from that eyepiece of his. He wants to make a better, happier Gaia, and he'll destroy anyone who stands in his way of creating Utopia. Nice beard, though. As the war drags Vaughn, Hitomi, and Merle across Gaia, they'll pick up an important ally in Alan, a crack swordsman and mecha pilot for the country of Astoria. He's so chivalrous and handsome, Hitomi's got a new crush. Hitomi has also discovered that on Gaia, she has a new and terrifying power. She sees visions of the future, the present, and the past. Her prescience helps Vaughn fight invaders at the cost of making Hitomi part of his war machine. And her visions of the past reveal horrible secrets that perhaps she'd rather not know. Often, she'd rather not know her visions of the future either, because those visions can be horrifying. But... Those visions make her a monkey wrench in Dornkirk's plan to control fate, because she can also alter fate with her visions. The TV series blends so many disparate elements, it's amazing that it holds together. It's got a fantasy world that includes transforming mecha and mixes it with dragons and other exotic creatures. It has swords, bows, and arrows, ancient kingdoms with royal politics, loyalty, and love. And it even tosses in the legend of Atlantis. It has a sizable cast of characters, headlined by a plucky heroine with some mysterious, ill-defined power to see and influence fate, and a plot that considers destiny as something that's tangible that can be manipulated, and luck as something that you can inject into warriors almost like steroids. It has warfare and combat, tragedy and joy, people with secret pasts, and quite a few surprising plot twists. 
and it's got a lot of romance with strong, handsome heroes and brave, pretty heroines. It would be easy for all this to fall apart into an incomprehensible mess, but it holds together remarkably well. One of the things that holds it together are the characters. He told me Vaughn, Allen, Milerna, Merrill, Falcon, and even some of the characters who only appear for a short while are mostly likable and always intriguing. <laughs> Escaflone was conceived and written by Shoji Kawamori, perhaps best known for the Macros movie Do You Remember Love, as well as more recent titles such as Arjuna or Spring and Chaos. It's directed by Kazuki Akane. The character designs are by Nobuteri Yuki of Lotos and Battle Angel. He's give the faces some sharply pointed noses that I thought I shouldn't have liked, but somehow did. The animation is by Sunrise, and they give it plenty of nice visuals of the many kingdoms of Gaia and its strange technologies. Kawamori likes unusual camera angles and dramatic settings. They mix in some early uses of computer graphics for exotic textures and lighting effects, such as sunlight sparkling on the ocean, for example. The animation will also provide some outstanding combat sequences, and I have to praise Yoko Kano's musical score. It sounds like an incompatible blend of techno instrument beat with a neo-Gregorian chant, but it adds so much to both the mystery of the setting and the exotic drama of the action scenes. So I give Vision of Escaflone four stars. It's a triumph of character, drama, romance, and style over plot. With its mix of heroic action, exotic romance, and mecha action, it's also an interesting crossover title for many tastes. Escaflone has a pleasant opening song sung by Maya Sakamoto, who also voices the starring role of Hitomi. Bondi released Escaflone in North America on eight DVDs and in a box set that also threw in the Escaflone movie, A Girl in Gaia, which I will get to separately. The first and last DVDs of those set have extras with music video and live concert appearances by singer Sakamoto, though the acoustics on the concert aren't very good. The other six DVDs have gab fests of some of the voice cast in a bar setting, and interviews with director Akane and writer Kawamori, and a chat with some of the mecha designers and animators. I didn't find Bandai's English dub at all convincing of this show, and I don't think it's just my fondness for my old Japanese Laserdisc editions either. On the English dub of the first episode, when Hitomi cries, I could almost laugh the crying sounded so fake. I strongly recommend sticking with the Japanese cast on this one. Escaflone also had a brief run on the U.S. Fox TV network, edited for kids' cartoon block, with most of the violence excised. Forget about it. One of the points of this series is the suffering this war inflicts on people. Dornkirk's indifferent to that suffering, and the way the violence begins to seduce Vaughn, and the toll that all these horrors exact on Hitomi and friends. Thanks for watching.